thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Awesome. It's great to be here and join AdCash today. So um, I would love to start off by hearing a little bit more about what you do. Uh, your LinkedIn profile says you are a digital marketing, sales, and business development expert. Uh, I'd like to see what that means in your world, uh, and particularly in terms of what you're doing at the moment in uh, at Click Dealer. Yeah, it's definitely very generic. Uh, but uh, in terms of what I do, I guess we'll kind of break it down into two things. So my background originally was in English and journalism, and then um, media buying and and SEO and some other stuff like that. And and eventually stumbled into the world of performance marketing. So uh, for the last uh, seven years, I've been working on the network side of performance marketing uh, at a company called F5 Media, and then uh, the current role that I'm with, which is at Click Dealer uh, and GDM Group. And so uh, that's kind of where I've ended up uh, and the experience that I have. We work with a lot of different verticals, a lot of different traffic channels. Um, and so it's very general what we do overall. But the kind of the heart of what Clear Dealer does and what I do on a day-to-day -day is we work with affiliates, we work with, with buyers, and we just connect them, uh, basically from uh, the leads that we're bringing in and the leads that we're selling. So we're a, a full-service uh, performance marketing network. Um, we provide technology solutions for, for our publishers. And uh, yeah, we do a little bit of everything uh, from dating to lead generation to sweepstakes, uh, basically everything under the sun, which is, you know, usually what a network uh, ends up dabbling in for sure. Awesome. What would you say are some of your top services? Uh, uh, for anyone who wants to understand the platform a little bit more and the services you provide? Yeah, for sure. So in 2019, we actually launched our own uh, network platform, uh, which was a huge benefit to us. So on the technology side, we offer a really robust suite of tracking and reporting opportunities and, and tools for publishers that work with us. So that's one of our main services we've been able to offer over the last few years. It's been hugely beneficial to us being a network as big as we are to be able to be on our own technology and our own hub. It, it means we can deploy updates when stuff like Facebook conversion pixels go crazy or the iOS changes that have happened. Uh, so we are able to, to really respond quickly and be nimble on that. In terms of the verticals that we really focus on, uh, everyone knows click dealer for dating. Dating is what we started in, and it's really the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, we launched a smart link uh, technology a few years ago that's been hugely successful to develop that vertical. And then further down, I would say one of our main focuses for the last 18 to 24 months is really lead generation as like a one, two kind of combo, really focusing on the North American and European markets in more evergreen verticals uh, like home services and home renovation, insurance, finance, legal and really working with some of those evergreen verticals that have kind of come new again, that people are looking to really build a business around versus just running, burning and churning accounts and, and campaigns. Speaking of lead generation, could you expand on the term? It's, you know, it's a term that's used quite frequently yeah. in a number of different industries. If you had to summarize it uh, in your world and in, you know, in, in marketing in general, what would you, uh, how would you do that? Yeah, so that is really interesting. Whenever I talk about lead generation, I actually love to do this, is just really define what we're talking about. Because if you're in performance marketing, you could be looking at lead generation campaigns as simple email submits for a sweepstakes campaign, for example. But what we're really talking about here, when, when I mention it for what we're working on at Click Dealer, is real products and services uh, being driven to real customers. So let's say, uh, it, for example, you're working with native Facebook email. It's really about capturing that that lead and selling it on an insurance product, selling it uh, forward for an appointment to go get your roof repaired or replaced and working with those real companies and real products and services. Not so much the data side of things where we're often seeing it with single opt-in or double opt-in offers. This is looking to generate a real lead um, and a real customer for a business. Um, and again, that business could be a contractor who's doing you no know, emergency plumbing overnight because your pipes are leaking or it could be someone coming in and selling you a suite of insurance uh, for your family, whether it's life, health, um, or home insurance. How would you say lead generation has changed in the last, uh, let's say, five years? Uh, how has it expanded? How are people utilizing it today? I think there's two main ways it's, it's changed or it's expanded. And I think for the most part, it stayed pretty stable because the industries that we're talking about are evergreen there's always a demand for, for customers. 
Uh, the big change has been on the technology side, the way that we're able to be more transparent uh, and also drive quality, how we're able to adapt and, and look at what a lead is really worth. It's no longer just a name and an email, it's a zip code, it's looking at what you're trying to do, maybe the size of your windows, maybe all the way down to the specific city or service that you're doing. And we're able to pass on so much more information now than we were able to do before. And then the pivotal role uh, of that technology, being able to push that lead to, to a buyer who has a call center, who can follow up right away and close that lead. I think that's really grown over the last you know, five, six years where the technology has really improved. And the second part has really been kind of tied in with technology, but able to, to detect fraud uh, has, has really improved. And that's hugely beneficial to both sides, to affiliates and to, to buyers, because we can pinpoint exactly where that issue is. It could be on a traffic source, it could be on a placement, uh, or it could be someone that is doing something fraudulent. So the technology really protects us as a network, but it also protects the buyer and the affiliate uh, from hiccups down the road. So I think those are the two main ways we've seen a lot of growth. Um, and, and kind of for us as a network, we've been around for eight to nine years. And so for us, there's a kind of a lifespan of affiliates. You know, they might start with push traffic or pop traffic, but eventually they get tired of that churn and burn and they're looking to really build a business. And they're really looking to maybe expand a media buying team more often than not. And so having something evergreen like White Hat to really, you know, and, and lead generation to really build around means you can build a business, not a campaign. And that's kind of our tagline. We're looking to help you build a business, not just a quick buck. So you can create a multi-channel approach to lead generation, say with, you know, initially running Facebook, but you're also capturing emails. So now you can mail them. And behind that, you've built out an actual website with actual content to drive up organic traffic and to bring those guys back with a brand like Bob the Builder or whatever you want to call it. Um, and now you've got a multi-channel approach that's bringing in organic and paid leads and with an evergreen vertical where quality is always in demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. To summarize that, what would you say the core strategies for an affiliate who's just starting out and like you say, wants to go to the next level, wants to have a business you know, rather than a, you know, call it a side hustle, what would you say are the top three strategies that are relatively easy to start off with uh, when they're trying to bring in leads, when they're trying to generate traction for their business? I think there's, there's three main areas I would look at if I'm coaching someone who's just getting started and, and maybe away from the actual media buying strategy because there's a lot of different ideas on how to actually like media buy when it's Facebook or native and, and how to test and, and split test. There's so much we could go into. But in terms of on the overarching, like if I'm an affiliate and I want to get into lead generation, and I'd be doing other things. There's three main areas I'd really say this is where you need to focus. Number one um, is definitely having patience. With lead generation, you're not going to just blast out leads really quickly and get paid out. You have to be patient. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be patient in, in, in really being able to drive leads, optimize, get feedback from the advertiser, and really understand the process of, of what that advertiser is looking for. If, if we take, for example, roof, uh, a roofing offer, what you're doing is you're driving an initial lead to a form that leads being sold. A call center is probably going to verify and try and set up an appointment. Once an appointment happens, um, then there's either a sale or there's not a sale or, or uh, you know, a product going on. But all those steps go into the KPIs and metrics that an advertiser is looking at. So you could be generating leads up front and we need to be able to verify and, and help you optimize and test and expand and scale. So really the focus has to be on quality over quantity, which is why for me being patient is the number one strategy you can have when you get into lead generation. You can't expect to be driving high quality leads right away. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Even if you're using something as great as Facebook, or that gives you so much ability to target. I just, it's not gonna happen overnight. You really have to work on building it. The second strategy is not getting too tied to one traffic channel. So I already mentioned it, but a multi-channel approach is always going to benefit you as a media buyer or as an affiliate. Uh, there's mm -hmm. studies um, and a report that I was looking at a few weeks ago where for every channel you're adding, you're adding about 20 to 30% ROI because you're building off of that knowledge you already have of that customer, of the product, of the demographic. And so if you start with Facebook, how do we turn that, that first Facebook lead into multiple points of contact? where you're able to get a higher ROI. So instead of just selling that lead for five to $50, okay, now I'm also capturing an email. So now I can start mailing them 
you know, related offers. If it's a roofing, maybe I'm mailing home insurance or gutters or window replacement, you know, adding in those extra levels. And of course, backing out to an actual brand. So you have your Facebook page tied in with a website where you're getting organic traffic now, and then also pulling in search. That's the easiest example because it's just, there's three traffic channels that now you're expanding and you're just making your efforts, you know, on your initial ad spend, you're stretching it further and further. So that would be the second way is taking a multi-channel approach. Um, and the third way is just do your research. Uh, really understand and know the product that you're trying to sell in lead generation, understand the service, know what the call center is going to say when they pick up the phone and making sure that you have a really transparent uh, and congruent message from that first impression all the way through. As someone who I really respect um, once told me, no one goes on Facebook or social media to be a customer, right? No one goes there to be sold something. They go there to connect with their friends, look at a meme, uh, maybe they're addicted to social media, but no one's going on and be like, man, I really want to buy your product or service. That's just not what they're doing. They go to Amazon for that, or maybe reviews on YouTube or, or they search. You don't go to social media for that. So your job is to convert them. And once they've made that click, you can't lose them, right? So making sure you're doing the research, you're putting quality content out there, your ad copies really put in and, and nailed down. And for me, doing the research and really understanding the product and the customer and everything from A to Z, that's the third and probably most important part of lead generation. When we talk about you know real products and real services, you have to be an expert to be able to sell that product and get the right customers. Hmm. Absolutely. Go, yeah. Going back to Facebook for a second, you know, there's there's been a lot of updates recently. Would you say that it's harder than it was? to generate the right kind of appeal, the right kind of traction on Facebook and similar channels these days? Or do you think, I don't know, do you think the way the world is going right now with COVID, has it implemented, has it influenced it or, or sort of impacted it in a negative way? I think there's a couple of ways to approach it. I think we as marketers love to complain and always say it was easier back in the day. We did it yeah. with mobile content. We did it with, with ringtones and wallpapers and, and whatever uh, in the past. We always like to say, oh, it was so much easier in the past. And I think to a point it is, but I also think with more power and more opportunity in terms of technology, it makes it more competitive because the barrier to entry means there's more marketers in the business, more small and medium businesses are on Facebook, Instagram, and they're competing with you, right? So there's definitely more competition for a customer, which is why a lot of what I just said about quality and focusing on treating every one of those clicks like precious and making everything stretch and, 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 and increase your ROI is so important. So I definitely mm -hmm. think it, it might be more, it might be harder to find that customer or you might have higher costs uh, and higher competition, but at the same time, a savvy marketer or someone who is really willing to hone their craft is able to compete in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely think if you're willing to invest the time, you're really able to harness and embrace uh, the platform for what it is, is so important. And to add to that, when we're talking about lead generation and real customers, real products, you're working with the platform, not against it. So we're not talking about cloaking or hiding your leads or misleading ads or stuff like that, where you're getting banned or dealing with that sort of thing. You're using the platform for what it does best, right? And that's something that I, I love to kind of preach to, to marketers who are looking at white hat and or lead generation as an opportunity is when you're using search or native or Facebook, you're harnessing that platform now, not hiding from it. Uh, and so that's one of the things that, that I love about it. And I think if you're willing to put that extra effort in, you're always going to come out on top. Mm -hmm. Talking about the wonderful, confusing world of digital marketing, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, extremely loose term, you know, but um, how would you define digital marketing as opposed to performance marketing? Or would you say that they're one and the same? They can be the same. They're interchanging, right? It's like when you say the United Kingdom or Great Britain uh, and everyone goes, what do you mean? And what are right. the different changes? And they're just, you know, a country here, a country there or a border. Um, so I think for digital marketing, it encompasses everything, right? So um, whether it's brand awareness or whether it's, you know, lead generation or whatever it is, I think digital marketing encompasses a lot of things. Uh, whereas performance marketing, we're always looking at, you know, most often it's affiliate marketing and you're looking at a CPA or a paid action uh, where you're dealing with that kind of paid traffic. So 
I think they're, you know, everything is digital marketing, but not everything is performance marketing uh, would be kind of how I would say it. Got you, got you. Is there a way to condense such a broad term into actionable steps for somebody who's starting out and they, you know, have a website, they have a product, mm-hmm. they want to sell it, they want to generate returns in, as we all do, the fastest possible time frame. Is there sort of a one, two, three step by step approach to getting their product out there in the quickest possible time frame that you could take us through? I think the first, I, I think there's there's a few different approaches. You know, you, you mentioned a few things there, but let's let's take small businesses as an opportunity. And let's mm-hmm. say you're a, a small fashion business, for example. Let's say men's fashion, because it's it's an mm-hmm. easy way to hone in. The first thing you should be looking at if you're brand new to it is look at what your competitors are doing. Uh, because that's your, you know, we're looking at a world where you mentioned COVID. So many more small and medium businesses are on platforms that they weren't on a year and a half ago, 18 months to 24 months ago. Uh, you can look either with social media or even stuff like Uber Eats, for example, restaurants that had to adapt with technology where there's no customers coming in your store. You can reflect that in, in small businesses, whether you're a men's fashion uh, store or whether you are a, a copy store and a printing you know, business where you've had to adapt your business. So with that in mind, if you're getting into something, do your research, look at what your competitors are doing, look at what the main brands are doing. There's lots of free ways that you can do this. For Facebook example, uh, you can go to their page and you can look at their ad library. It's very transparent now that you couldn't do before um, where you're able to look at what your competitors are doing. There are products like SEM Rush for SEO where you can do a free trial or a very low cost trial to look at the keywords or look at how people are finding your competitor's business. So I would say the first thing before you spend anything is really look at the research and and find out what your competitors are doing. And number two is do your own research on how those platforms work. For Facebook or Instagram or or whatever you're trying to compete on, there are thousands of YouTube videos or thousands of, you know, hundreds of forums or articles of free information online just to get yourself to that basic level of information. Um, And that would be for me, you know, that number one and number two is just before you even spend a dollar is be ready. And if you're not very savvy with technology or you're, you know, you're not comfortable with it, you can still build it up yourself or find someone that is. It's okay to outsource it. Um, You don't have to be an expert on on marketing for your business to get into that industry. It's why networks exist. Uh, It's why there's tons of small boutique digital marketing and performance marketing companies to help generate leads for you. So I definitely think if you're a small business trying to get into it, do your research, find out what your competitors are doing. And then when you do start testing, make sure that you're okay with spending that budget. And that's one of the biggest things and the biggest pitfalls is marketers or people new in the industry will go and spend, you know, a thousand dollars, but then they've got nothing else to spend. And they've just popped it off in a couple of days or a week or two. And there's no longevity to it. No one's becoming a Facebook millionaire overnight on a two week trial, or no one's really finding that kind of success. So if you do have a thousand dollars to budget on, let's say a Facebook ad, making sure you're stretching it out, making sure you have your testing phase and then your optimization phase, and then, you know, how you're able to expand. Um, You know, one of the biggest mistakes people make is retargeting too early when you don't have a big enough um, audience to really retarget yet. And then now you're spending money let's say you only had 40 leads and now you've got a retargeting campaign going on. Now you're hammering those same 40 people uh, that maybe are converting for you. So I think there's lots of mistakes to make, but you, you combat that by doing the research ahead of time uh, and really looking in you know, deeper before you jump into the deep end. Mm-hmm. Do, you have, uh, do you have any tips for, you know, for our audience about starting a paid advertising campaign? Regardless of, the, regardless of the channel, I mean, wh- what are we looking at in terms of like a starting up budget, uh, in terms of creatives, utilizing the right ad formats, finding the right targets? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks around that? I think uh, if you're, let's say, an affiliate and, and working with a network like us, I think that's probably the easiest example is, number one, before you even send a campaign, ask your affiliate manager for, for insight as well. So let's say you have a traffic channel or you know what you want to promote because you came from a forum or you've been researching with your friends or you know someone you got in the industry, but you're brand new. So everyone kind of ends up there eventually and, and has a different story is, you know, number one, if you decide on a traffic channel, go look what's actually on that traffic channel before you start to promote. 
Um, and then, you know, just, just try and get as much information as possible. The actual technique I would say is what I just mentioned is like plan ahead your budget. That's mm -hmm. such a mistake that people don't do and make sure you have enough money to do what you want to do. You can split test a budget very easily on 40, $50 a day on a platform and then be able to look at your data at the end of the week, optimize it for week two, and then continue to optimize, change up your, your ad. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen people make is ripping bad ad copy. Uh, so you're going on to start something new and everyone says, okay, just rip something else and, and test it. But that doesn't always work for a number of reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is the ad copy could be terrible. Just because you're seeing on a platform doesn't mean that it's working. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that's a huge mistake people make is ripping and just running other people's terrible ad copy. Uh, you can pay on Fiverr very, you know, on, or any type of outsourcing to get ad copy written for you or get headlines written for you for, for whatever, and then pick your best and then split test. So I just, mm -hmm. def I just definitely think those are two of the main things is, is making sure you're set up properly with a budget. When you start testing, you can stretch it and then don't be lazy, right? Like you do the work and, and actually dive in uh, and make sure that, you know, you as a marketer are trying, you know, your hardest, putting your best foot forward, especially because money doesn't grow on trees. Many people end up in affiliate marketing um, because they're looking to work from home or have that freedom, or you know, they know someone that's doing it, but they don't know how much work really goes into it to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think um, you know, there's so many pitfalls that you can do is, and I know I'm harping on it, but the preparation you do before you go live with a campaign and doing your research and, and being prepared um is is just so important mm. i imagine it's harder than ever to stand out from the crowd yeah you, know, you need the, you need the right image combination the right copy combination and you need the right vertical the right product uh, the yeah. right offer what what, if, what would you say are some of the the top performing verticals right now you know given given the global situation given the state of the market what are we what are we talking i know you mentioned a few earlier but uh yeah, I think there's some obvious ones out there, like for example, e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce and drop shipping seem to be more and more popular as people turn to more online shopping over the last 18 months. Uh, a lot of businesses that didn't offer online shopping before are into the market, so it is more competitive. Uh, but you know, um, capitalizing on e-commerce products right now, you know, air conditioner units are massive because of the heat waves going on in the U.S. and other countries. Um, and so you see that as a huge e-com product. Fitness products have been massive over the last year and a half as people are at home, whether it's jump ropes or a weight or, or whatever it is. Um, I think those are, are some massive verticals and massive opportunities that have been really positive. Um, online dating has been really big. So dating is always pretty big, but you know, when you're in a pandemic and you can't go meet people and you need that social interaction, we've definitely seen that over the last year and a half has been massive. Um, and, and so I don't think there's just one main thing for me that I would say, this is where it's had a huge impact, but I definitely do think there's, you know, five or six different verticals, many we've already mentioned that are doing very well right now. Um, and I think affiliate marketers love to chase things. A few months ago, crypto, when it was going wild, everyone's running crypto, uh, banners or, or exchange banners and that sort of stuff, uh, to go work with Binance or, or whoever, like a, a trading platform. That's obviously as people aren't in the news, like searching for it because Bitcoin's a billion dollars, uh, that's cooled off, right? So following mm -hmm. the trends, I think that's a, a lot of what marketers do is there's a, there's a huge group of people that just follow the shiny trend. And there's another right. part, kinda, there's another portion that kind of stay the course and stick with what they're doing. And there's no right or wrong way. Um, but I think that's definitely how the, the two different approaches to how you, you find your, your best verticals, if you will. Mm, I was gonna. I was gonna actually mention that. Yeah, I mean, with with Elon Musk's announcement and all of that, it, it's very tempting to chase shiny things. But from what I understand yeah. as well, it's also very, uh, very important to stick the course. You know, uh, to kind of stay yeah. with tried and tested verticals that have performed year on year. I imagine. Well, and that's particularly uh, true about lead generation, for example. Uh, for mm -hmm. whatever reason, uh, Q1 of this year was massive on auto insurance in the U.S. market. It was a huge oh. influx of people competing to generate leads for auto insurance. Uh, and so that became a super saturated market and it drove a lot of people out of it that had been running for a while who had to pivot to other verticals, whether it's health insurance or 
uh, other types of offers or finance offers. Um, but they're all, they, you know, they keep their campaigns going and they jump back to it um, as it's not super saturated. So I think once you're able to, to build out, I think we talked about a multi-channel approach. I think a multi-vertical approach is also important. Don't get mm -hmm. too tied into one thing where, you know, if regulations change, if a global pandemic happens, um, mm -hmm. that you're able to adapt in, uh, to those changing situations. Right, right. Yeah. Where would you say affiliate marketing is going? Where do you think it will, what, what are the main trends taking place right now? And where do you see it five years from now? I mean, if you listen to some people, um, I know Charles Noe did a controversial interview a few months ago saying affiliate marketing is dead. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we, we go through that affiliate marketing is dead every few months, really, uh, or every few years, you know, someone decides whether it's an update. Mm -hmm. Going back to SEO, the big Panda update a few, you know, 15 years ago, whatever it is now, where SEO got destroyed and I mean, SEO is still working or the face, Facebook changes or even the Apple iOS changes that just happened. It was like yes. the, sky was, the sky was falling. People have adapted. People have learned how to work with the changes and things are fine. I think we're going to have a lot of uh, industry change when cookies are really uh, changing in the marketplace. That seems to be where we're going. Uh, Chrome has just announced, I think it was Chrome, that they're delaying some of their changes uh, and Google as well. So what I would say is we're always going to have change in this industry. Um, it's always going to be harder for people who want to do gray or black hat marketing techniques, which I think is good for, for networks and affiliates and, and buyers that want to build a business. Um, and, and so I definitely think uh, you're going to see much more transparency, better technology improvements will increase that transparency. And I think that's great for everybody and those who want to put, put the effort into to real marketing and, and, and not just, you know, throwing something at the wall and hoping it sticks. So I think you're going to continue to see technology changes, regulatory changes, and it's going to continue to impact everybody. Uh, but if you're one of those marketers that's built up a business on evergreen lead generation, for example, you're gonna ride that wave because if you have a market like that, or even dating, people are not gonna stop dating because the internet changes, right? There's, they're still gonna need leads. There's, people are still gonna want high quality leads. So if you as a marketer can focus on quality, I think no matter how the industry changes, there's always gonna be a demand for you, right? Someone's already always gonna to wanna to pay for your leads because even when, you know, changes happen or during a pandemic, businesses have, you know, have to make money. So I definitely think if you can focus on that, you'll be able to adapt to change. Could you share any tools, software, um, systems, anything, anything that would help people succeed right now as digital marketers, as affiliate marketers, as publishers, uh, anything that maybe you use particularly? One of the tools I love to use is SEMrush, which is an SEO tool. Um, just because I find that search is really indicative of, of what people are, are thinking about and doing, right? Is that's one of the main places we all go. As you know, either we either ask Alexa or we 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 type it into our phone and we ask the dumbest questions all day long. I don't know how many times a day I ask what the temperature is outside. Uh, but search is always an indicator of what people are thinking and what's going on in society. I think that's a key place. So SEM rush for me is always important. I want to see where my competitors are getting leads. I want to see who's backlinking where. And I think it's a great tool and super underutilized. Uh, you could also look at display ads on there too. So if you're looking at a tool that does a little bit of everything, I love SEM rush. It's a great tool. Um, I think there's there's countless tools out there. I think if you're an affiliate and you're not using a tracker, I think that's a huge misstep. There seems to be something. Uh, where new affiliates will come into affiliate marketing and think they can save costs by not using a tracker. I think that really hurts you uh, long-term to be able to optimize and really have control of your campaigns. Uh, I think it, you know, you could always just fire something up to see if it's converting and, and, and then add something in later. But I definitely think using a, a, a solid tracker is important. Uh, there's a few that we, we always mention, uh, volume or red track for me are two that I love. Uh, Binom seems to be very popular in the the Eastern European market, uh, those those three trackers, I'd, I'd feel comfortable using myself any day of the week. Um, and then I don't know if it's a tool, but using your affiliate manager or your rep at the company that you're working with. So ad cash, for example, or a volume, like I said, talking to your rep and making, you know, making sure you're getting help and insights into what you're doing. 
Um, I mean, not all traffic platform will be able to give you a rep like Facebook, for example, um, or, or big native networks. But if you're working with an affiliate network, you have an account manager, you have an affiliate manager, treat them as an extension of your team. So that would be like a tool that I would use is getting the most out of them, getting the insights, finding out what they know. Um, I think that's something a lot of affiliates are scared to do. And I think uh, whether it's a traffic platform, whether it's a technology platform, um, or whether it's a, you know, an, an affiliate network, really using your, your contact there as a tool for yourself, I think is super important. It happens all the time with trackers too. I, you know, people pay for a service and then they don't want to ask for help, right? When there's a tracking issue, they ask, you know, the network or they blame the traffic source, but they don't want to go and ask, you know, volume, you know, Hey, what happened with my campaign? And, and, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions as an affiliate, um, whether it's with a traffic platform a network or a, te or a technology solution. Awesome, awesome. Uh, on that note, what is, what, where is the best place for affiliates to find offers? If they're not, if they're not running with their own products or services, how, mm -hmm. where are some of the best platforms to do that? I think there's a lot of different um, places like an offer vault or, or you know, um, I'm, I'm gonna go blank on other websites. I'm not a fan of them. Uh, and mm -hmm. not, not, not offerable specifically, but just in general, because right. often there's too much information, right? How are we going to find yeah. out when there's 50,000 ads on a, on a platform? Yeah. Uh, and it seems to be something a lot of places have been doing is setting up an API with networks, putting in, you know, a thousand offers. And then as an affiliate blank, here you go, find out what works. Yeah, uh, so it's, I don't information overload. it's information overload, right? And, totally. and that's, a, yeah. that's a huge thing that we deal with, but as uh, you know, Affiliates get, kind of get obsessed with it or they'll mm -hmm. want to report with 500 top offers on it. Um, and then how are you supposed to be able to know what's going on? So right. I think um, it's too much information. How am I going to choose between these 500 soup steaks offers, one offer to test when they've all got an EPC within five to 10 cents of each other? Like mm -hmm. it's crazy. They all look identical. Yeah, exactly. So I think for me, finding offers, you know, researching, looking on your platform or whatever traffic channel you've decided to use Obviously, that's a no-brainer. Uh, number two, talking to your rep and, and giving them, asking more specific questions. Don't just ask for a top offer, but if you know there's a country you think there's an opportunity in or there's a vertical you want to try or a traffic source you want to try, ask them. Ask your affiliate network. Say, hey, what's working on, um, you know, Taboola or Outbrain or AdCash um, or what's working um, with push or native traffic or what's working in Canada or Australia, right? Like, Ask better questions than, hey, can I just have a top offer report? Or, hey, I'm going to go look at Offer Vault and try and find an offer. Um, I, I just think it's it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, with e-commerce products, it's a little different because usually guys who are running that, they'll look at what's trending on, on TikTok or on Search or on Amazon or, um, or wherever, and they'll be able to find products or they'll have people that are doing the research for them, just pulling products and testing them to see if there's any interest, right? So it's a little different with e-com offers, but in terms of general affiliate offers, I would say, look at what's running, talk to your affiliate manager, um, look in forums, look and see what's being run, um, and, and you'll get a better indicator of, of what where to kind of look. Gotcha, gotcha, awesome. That, we, we completely <laughs> tore through that. Uh, I have one or two more, slightly more generic questions, and then, sure. uh, yeah. And then I'll leave it to enjoy your morning. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to dive in on that we've covered or? Yeah, I think this has been great. I wanted to ask you um, what a day in your life looks like, like at your, at your company, what, uh, what keeps you busy from morning till night? So that's a, that's a great question because I've been working from home since March, 2020. So uh, yeah. So being in Toronto, Canada, uh, we closed our office for, for click dealer in March, March 13th, I believe it was. Uh, 2020, and we were expected to be back in a few months. Yeah. Um, at that point, I was commuting about two and a half, three hours each day as well. So if mm -hmm. anyone knows in North America, it goes basically like LA and then Toronto for bad commutes in, in North America. It's it's terrible. So my day is is awesome. Uh, you know, I, I get up around 6 a.m. Uh, every day, if not earlier. Uh, I've always been a morning person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, I uh, you know, I'll go on, I'll you know, I have a coffee every morning on my back deck if it's nice enough. Today it's been pouring rain. I kind of reset the day. And then keeping me busy for me specifically 
a lot of my job is, is managing problems uh, because right. I work with our, our affiliate management team and our supply team. You know, if there's an issue with a publisher or a payment or a partner, that's a lot of what I deal with. Uh, so my day is, is calls, it's emails, it's calls that probably should be emails um, and um, kind of goes along like that. Um, and so I can definitely say my job is never the same two days in a row. Uh, it's always a different challenge. And, and, you know, I'm the change that's going to happen is I'm finally uh, next week off to affiliate some of these. So uh, that'll be my first conference in a year and a year and a half, yeah. which for me, prior to the pandemic, I was off to China and Europe uh, yeah. all the time because we have teams there. So uh, for now it's, it's been quiet and now we'll be getting back on the, the conference and travel mode pretty quickly. So um, I don't think I answered your question at all, but uh, my day, every day is different and every day is a challenge, Jeff. I can no, definitely that say that. That's very, <laughs> that's very cool. How can we reach you? How can our audience follow some of the, um, some of the talks, the discussions that you've been doing? Uh, sure. Where are you on social media? There's a couple of different places to find me. Um, on Instagram, I have uh, like a, a company account uh, at the Henry Whitfield. Uh, so first name, last name with the in front. Uh, and then for Click Dealer in general, you can find us basically everywhere on under the handle at Click Dealer, whether it's LinkedIn, uh, whether it is on social media or our, our website, clickdealer.com. Um, you. If you're interested in specific verticals, uh, then clickdealer.com slash lead gen will take you to our lead gen landing page, connect you with specialists okay. there. If you're interested in dating, you can go clickdealer.com slash dating. Uh, you mm -hmm. can find out information there as well. So, um, you know, most of our team is, is, is great. And if you end up in the wrong channel, you're going to get connected with the right people. Uh, but uh, definitely the, the main places to kind of connect with us. Um, and, and for sure, I guess the one big thing I should mention is we are getting to the end of a six month competition at Click Dealer. It's our Click Dealer Nitro competition. So we're giving away almost $500,000 worth of the prizes so far and giving away a Porsche uh, at the end of the month. So wow. e even if you sign up now, you can still qualify for a chance to win that Porsche. So yeah. um, that's the crazy thing is it's been going on for six months, but if you jump on and, and you can generate some money, you can still qualify for a chance to win, which, uh, which uh, is, is crazy to me, but hey, we love to yeah. give things away. So, very, um, very, very so cool. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that for sure. Very nice, very nice. When did you say the competition is closing? Uh, it closes at the end of this month. Uh, so on month. at okay. the end of end of July, uh, will be when it officially closed. We extended it by a month because uh, it was going so well. Um, we're actually giving away a bonus chances to win the car on July 25th. We'll do a live draw. We're going to give away 10 okay. basically tickets for a chance to win the car. Um, and then we'll do the actual draw uh, at the end of the month. Uh, hopefully, COVID uh, and all that, uh, a live event uh, in Kiev which would be super exciting. Kiev, yeah. okay, very cool, very cool. And how do people get on get on board with that? How do people register up to that? Uh, it's If you uh, sign up to the network and you join the network, uh, yeah. you can talk to your affiliate manager. Uh, okay. you, can find, you can find details at clickdealer.com slash nitro. Uh, we keep it simple. Whatever it is, we just slash and that's the name. So clickdealer.com slash nitro. And you can find out all the details about the competition, how to get involved, how to sign up, um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's our biggest competition we've ever done in almost a decade. So, uh, we've, we've loved every moment of it, especially during a pandemic, uh, and not being able to get to conferences. It's been an awesome way for us to reward our partners. Yeah. That's awesome. A pandemic Porsche. I can think of nothing better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I would love a chance to win it myself, but yeah, geez, I can imagine. That's really cool. Very cool. <laughs> I meant to ask you something, Henry, you guys are on clubhouse as well, from what I yeah. understood. What is what is your take on Clubhouse? Are you enjoying this? Are you enjoying it? Is it working out for you guys? So personally, I love it. I'm on it all the time. Uh, I use it. I, I join in conversations. It's like ends up being background noise, or I'll end up joining. You know, conversations I want to be in. Mm -hmm. I think as a business, it's a tough platform to grow because they don't have the things you need. You can't. Right. You know, when we first launched, um, and we had some excellent conversations with amazing guests. I think it's just a really tough platform to grow as a network or what we were trying to do. And I, right. I think you can see a lot of the groups that are joined are organic groups um, and a lot of got become stale. The same people talking about the same things each week. Okay. I think there's a lot of, there's so much potential in voice. I'm looking forward to, you know, Facebook and, and Spotify and Instagram and even Twitter has something now with voices. 
uh, yeah, that's out right. there. Those platforms coming out with a better version of Clubhouse because Clubhouse, I think, has missed some key things like being really able to build your brand, being able to you know, uh, connect and target the right people that you want listening, for example. Um, I just think there's, there's, there's missed opportunities. And being able to cross promote too. One of the big things about Clubhouse is, you know, it's not supposed to be recorded, right? Um, but how do you promote that conversation, that amazing conversation you had and put it on YouTube or Facebook and get people to hear it? We were having some awesome conversations. Um, and some really great content and great speakers, but then it's gone forever. It's and that was part, and that was part of the issue, right? So I think as a platform voice, I think voice is amazing because you can consume it in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be on camera. So it opens it up to so many more people. Um, but I definitely think there's a lot of challenges with Clubhouse. I love the platform myself. I think uh, we loved it as well. Uh, but I think there, someone can do it better in terms of a platform, or maybe Clubhouse can do it better themselves long-term. Um, I have hope uh, that we'll probably relaunch something uh, Q3. We've taken a couple months off. Um, like I said, when you're putting amazing content out there and then people only hear it for that time and then they can't find it afterwards, um, you know, it's a little disappointing, right? Uh, you yeah, want people to be sure. able to join those conversations. And even for sure. the people that joined us, right? They're like, man, we had such a great conversation. Where can I like pass it to my followers? Well, they can't. They're like, you can't. <laughs> and, Sorry. Yeah. And it took so long for Android to roll out too. Um, and I know with Snapchat, for example, it was the same thing. iOS first and Android. And that was a different time. We're in 2021. You can't release a something like that on, on Apple and then completely exclude Android users and expect the platform to be super successful um, or for what we were looking for, really be engaging. Like I had to buy an, an iPad just to get on the platform. Uh, for us to do it. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, so it's just crazy uh, sometimes. No, there's too many barriers there. Okay, yeah. well, interesting. Okay, I think I'm going to jump on it. Thanks for, thanks for- oh, uh, For sure jump on it. Like I love, yeah. I love the platform myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear, it's, I hear there's a lot of very interesting uh, discussions going on there. Maybe I'll say something, I don't know. Um, I have one last question for you and then we're sure. done. Do you have any final thoughts? Do you have any uh, advice any guidance, any tips, any strategies that you'd like to put out to the world? Um, well, that's a, that's a very broad question. It's a yeah. broad question, um, right? That's a, I, I think, that's I think, a big I, one. I think in general for affiliate marketing, I think one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give, and we've talked about it a few times today, is just really focusing on quality and transparency in 2021 and moving forward. Um, you know, moving more so away from the gray and black hack techniques uh, you know, of, of years gone by because technology is only pushing us further and further that way. So don't mm -hmm. be the person that's left behind. There's lots of uh, affiliate marketers that are, have, have pivoted and, and moved towards uh, running more transparently, using the platform, not hiding from the platform. I definitely think if you can take something away from this is take the time to learn how to do it properly. Don't cut corners. And that's going to be how you get that great ROI. It's how you're going to build a business. It's how you're going to stop working two jobs and then doing this on the side, right? It's learn how to do it properly. Don't cut corners. Um, and, and that's how you're going to build yourself a business. That would be the, the main takeaway for me. So got you. Yeah. Done. Amazing. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank no, I'm glad. I'm glad for taking the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm super happy to be here and, and always happy to connect on things. If you end up on clubhouse, I'm always happy to jump on there too. So, um, yeah, no, it's been great talking, Jeff. Brilliant.